Hey, what's going on, guys? Josh from Trailbuilt back with you guys with episode four of Shop Talk. So this is a series where we sit down with Blair and Brent and just talk about, well, shop things. We talk about fitment, we talk about different types of tires, we talk about suspension, we talk about everything that relates to projects that you guys are probably working on in your garages. So we also answer questions from the last video that we posted on our YouTube in the comments. So we'll answer some of your questions tonight as well, which we have some really good questions. So with that said, make sure and smash that subscribe button so that way you guys can hold on to the ride with us. You boys ready to get started? Ready. Ready. Let's go. I might be ready. All right, so one of the first questions that we're going to cover kind of goes back to one of our other episodes where we were talking about upgrading to bigger tires and all the ripple effects that come from that. And one of them is gearing. That's a big deal for a lot of people because once you start adding more weight, more rolling mass, your engine suffers. It just makes the engine work that much harder to move your rig around, move those tires around. So one of the best things you can do right off the bat is to re-gear re the differentials and put in a lower gear. So with that said, Raul Ramirez, he's got a Jeep Gladiator, a Sport, uh, so it's not a Rubicon, but the Sport does come with 410 gears. He wants to upgrade the 37 inch tires and maybe like a six inch lift. And he's doing a lot of towing and he wants to know what's a good gear with 37s at <clears throat> highway speeds that won't run the R's, the RPMs up too much, but still give them plenty of power Plus towing? Plus towing, Ooh. yep. Is that a six-speed automatic, or what's in it for a transmission? <laughs> well, the Jeep Gladiators came with, they or come with the automatic speed? has an eight-speed automatic transmission. You'd almost have to do the science mathematical yeah. equation because right off the bat, I'm thinking like 488s. That's what I said too, yeah. When I read this, I, that's the first thought I, I had in my mind was 488s. Now, will 410s and 37s be all right? It's not bad. If you want to keep the RPMs lower at highway speeds, a 410 is probably better. What's that come with a stock tire on? Is that like a 32, 33 stock? Yeah, I think they're 32s maybe, something like that. So, I mean, yeah, you'd have to run the, the equation to, to figure it out with the transmission yeah. and blah, 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 blah. But I, I, 488s would get you close. With re-gearing, there's a couple of different things that you can do to figure out what is going to be the right size gearing for the size tires that you're that you're getting. One of them is being to figure out what the ratio is. When we say four tens, it's a it's a four to ten ratio. It means that for every rotation that your tires are spinning, four to one, four to one. Four to one right? Well, four tens, four point one. Four point one. So four point one revolutions of the drive shaft per one revolution of the tire yeah so when we're saying like four tens yeah, it's cool. basically like a, a four to one ratio so for every four turns that the drive shaft is doing the tire is making one complete revolution so if you're trying to figure out what your rpms want to be what you want to be for your rpms if you want to keep them the same and go to a bigger tire you got to figure out basically how many revolutions they're going to turn per the size of the tire right and I have no idea how to do that, so. Just go 488, it'll be fine. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I would imagine if you did a quick Google search, you'd find something. Yeah. But uh, I mean, if that, I think that's something that we should have on our website, though. That, that would be huge when they're buying tires and wheels. Yeah. They'd be like, well, okay, so if my Jeep has got 410s in it now with a 32 and a half inch tire, I'm at this RPM, and if I go to a 37, it's gonna be this. Well. Now you should be able to have some kind of a graph or, or like a spreadsheet or something you could put up there where, okay, yeah. 37s are going to be at this RPM. And, <laughs> and it's vehicle specific too. Yeah. So yeah. Jeep Gladiator has eight <clears throat> speeds and an automatic transmission, different in a manual, plus Rubicons, different. So it would almost have to be vehicle specific, where you're looking to stay for your RPMs, what tire size you're looking to go to, and what's the the actual overall diameter because that's going to make a difference too so there's you know the the biggest point of this is there is a ton of different scenarios that yeah. you can go through to figure out exactly what gearing ratio you want to maintain what rpms or what's going to be better for towing like if you want a lot of low end power you want your gears to be a lower gear 
you know, if it's if it's got four tens in it right now, well, if you went to a five thirteen, then that would pretty much be the lowest gear you could probably fit in those axles. I'm I don't guessing. know what the smallest gear is for like a Dana thirty, Dana forty four. I yeah, I, I haven't messed yeah, I mean, with <laughs> those small of the yeah. axles in a long time, but I, I think you can get a five thirteen. Maybe a I, I don't know. I'd be lying. Yeah. But I know five thirteens, pretty much for Dana thirty. Would yeah. I, I think? Yeah, at least four eighty eights for sure. So if you go to you know if you go down to even though it's a it sounds like a higher number, you're actually going down in gear ratio when you say like a four eighty eight compared to a four ten. So a four ten would be better for highway speeds and keeping the RPMs down, but a a taller gear or a lower gear would be better for low end power torque output and towing. So throw some 37s on there, throw whatever you're towing on there and see how it does. If you don't like it, you can always go to a 456 or a 488. That's what I would say. Start with the tire, start with the lift and then see how you like it. And if it doesn't perform the way that you want it to perform, the engine's not putting up, putting out enough power then or you can always change transfer case too. Like if you want to cruise down the road, it seems all right cruising down the road, but then when you get in the rocks and stuff, it's like, oh man, it's working hard. Well then change the transfer case gears because yeah. then you, you can put that a Rubicon case in there, I believe. I don't know exactly if, if you can take an actual Rubicon case and just swap them, but those got a four to one in it or put Atlas in it, you know, and there you go. You can still keep the four 11s in it, cruise down the road, and then when you're going rock crawling or whatever you're in, like you know when that where it's working a little harder, bam, the transfer case can take the load off of it. Then, yeah, yep. My thought is uh, the one thing he's got going for him is being the newer vehicles with the eight speeds and the ten speeds, you have more gear selection to kind of tune it into where you want to be at cruising speed versus you know back in the day where you had a three or a four speed and it, it is what it is you didn't have much options there. to go 70 miles an hour you mm -hmm. had to be in your final drive whereas now you know you could be cruising in sixth gear mm -hmm. and your rpms are still fine kind of tune it into the sweet spot like where the vehicle is happy at that speed yeah and with the eight speeds and the ten speeds and you know the the transmissions with a lot more gearing options typically will have some sort of manual selector you know, they have the manual option where you can plus or minus and you know if you're finding that four tens you know are good for all around daily driving on 37s but you hook up a boat or a car trailer or whatever it may be and all of a sudden it's dogging it's lacking power well at highway speeds you can always you know keep it in fifth gear to keep the engine rpms up keep that engine in that power curve and then keep the power and the momentum going so it does that does bring up a really good point yeah with newer transmissions now like the old school stuff like my scout it's a three speed torque flight so with the 39 inch km3s on there and a two to one transfer case obviously in in in, in regular two wheel drive at 60 miles an hour the engines rpms are at 3000 rpms which is high i mean that's i'd ideally like to be closer to you know, like 1,700, 1,800 RPMs, highway speeds, 60, 65 miles an hour. But if you have an eight-speed transmission, you know, you, you can select fourth or fifth gears or sixth gear. And, and you can basically pick the RPM you want your motor to be at. Yeah. No, yeah. Because the, the gears are so short, so you can basically find where you, the, the happy spot is cruising. Right. I think best case scenario is just to run it the way it is with the 37s and six-inch lift and then see how it does and yeah. try out the shifting of the different gears. And if you still feel like it's just not enough power, you can always change to a taller gear or a lower gear. With, with uh, changing the gear ratio to like a 410, 488, it takes less stress off of the drive line because you're not stressing the torque converter, transmission, transfer case, drive shaft, U-joints, because your ratio is that much greater. But, yeah. you know, it, there are so many variables when you do that stuff that we could yeah. sit here and talk about this all day to our blue in the face and everybody has their own opinion it's kind of like okay well i i have this well i can kind of you know let this go or it, it's kind of just yeah. personal preference and 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 what you can't afford and what you can live with and what you, what you want exactly 
Yeah, there's a lot of different variables there. In every situation, when you're talking about vehicle modifications, you know, it's what are you doing with it? What exactly are you going to be running for tires? Um, you know, are you towing? Are you off-roading? Are you going fast off-road? Are you rock crawling, going slow? So, you know, all of these different yeah. situations really do come into play when you're trying to figure out your own personal situation as far as your build setup. So it really just comes down to, you know, <clears throat> start with the tires, start with the lift, try it out, see how you like it, and then upgrade from there if you need to. So, yeah, fair enough. But a very good question, Rawl. Definitely appreciate you asking that. Um, gearing is a whole other thing that, you know, we would love to get into more even at the shop too. You know, get the, uh, get the tools that are needed. And um, I know we had looked into that a while back, just being able to install gears because there's a couple of local shops, one in particular that we know of that, you know, will install a set of gears for, it was, it was around a couple thousand bucks. And uh, it takes time. I mean, it, you got to do it yeah. right. You yeah. got to you got to break in the gears. You got to set them up right. The backlash and yeah. everything Especially else. Especially like so. Dana thirties, you got to be spot on with that stuff. But uh, a Dana sixty, you have a little leeway. Like I got all the tools to do Dana sixty stuff, but uh, the smaller stuff, I just I, I don't have any. It's so I yeah, got, and like the a, tools fix my own. But yeah, it's it's it. You know, there's a lot of variables in in setting up gears and making sure the pinion depth and you know your backlash and all that. Well, gear. if somebody goes out and they don't break the gears in right, they don't get them to the right temperatures and harden the steel and everything else the way that they're supposed to, and then they blow it up, guess whose fault it is? Yeah, well, <laughs> the manufacturer, if you send them back, they can usually tell, and like, if you want a person, you can get a polished gear mm. that's already like broken. Oh, okay. And uh, I, I bought a set because I'm like, I, my truck isn't going to go down the road 60 miles an hour for how many miles to break them in. So I just bought right. a polished gear, hmm. but, uh, it's, it's, it's an option. I don't know if it's for every gear, but that is something too. Like if you're more of a hardcore off-roader, you're like, Oh man, I don't, I can't drive my rig down the road. Well, you can look into maybe getting a polished gear. Yeah. That's maybe an option, but yeah, I actually didn't even know they had such thing. Yeah. Is I that found that out not too long ago. Not too long ago. Smart. They're probably, Sick of losing their ass on broken gears <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and but shops yeah. getting all the blame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can you can set a set of gears up and it'll look all right, but mm -hmm. yeah. Unless it's a like a GM corporate fourteen bolt, then you can just throw whatever the hell you want in there and however you want to throw them in there. <laughs> throw some mud in there, some <laughs> sawdust, whatever. That's how you break them in, right? Yeah, or Toyota axle. You can run around without any gear lube in it all weekend, and then it'll hold up. <laughs> At their engines too. Yeah, right. The 22 RE. Yep. <laughs> no, that's a great question, Raul. Definitely appreciate you asking that. All right, so we just took a, a five minute break, refill our glasses here, and <laughs> check the comments for some other questions. And one of the guys brought up, you know, talking about Jeeps versus full size rigs. And then it, we started talking about overlanding and how overlanding has just been blowing up. and the market is just insanely huge for the overlanding market, camping, car camping, whatever you want to call it, expeditions, adventures, explorations, whatever it is. And then, so that just kind of led into Brent asking about what is the hype with overlanding? Because Brent's a rock crawler. He's, he's hardcore. He's the tons, the 40s, the custom tube chassis, the 500 horsepower fuel injected engines. and so. The whole works, and I'm kind of partial because I like both. I've got the Scout on tons and 39s or, or whatever, 40s, and I, I, love the, I love both aspects of the hardcore wheeling, the hardcore off-roading, and so it, it brings up this conversation of, you know, from coming from a, a hardcore guy, sure. you know, what is the hype behind well, overlanding? I, okay, so I want to know what defines an overlander like no rock crawlers get classified as the guys that come show up bring eight cases of beer they drink all weekend they're rowdy so if i go rock crawling have a bunch of beverages during the campfire and fall asleep in my vehicle am i overlanding <laughs> It like, depends. What are defines you, overlanding? Are you parked on a mountain-esque view with a 
I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I mean, is there a true definition to overlanding, or is it just a style of camping where you're relying on your vehicle to get you to your destination, and your vehicle is your camper? Overlanding is more defined as a journey. Yeah. It's not even about, I mean, the vehicle obviously is a tool to get you through that adventure, <laughs> to get you to that next destination and it's the adventure that's on the way so it's it's sightseeing it's it's traveling it's take, going to all these different locations so taking the path less traveled correct i take the path less traveled too sometimes i go through the woods sometimes i make my own trail am i overlanding eh, that's frowned on making well, own trails. See, I mean, now, you, now, you now are going now over the land now you, you eat that fine line of am i being the asshole Am, am I overlanding? Like, that's like... You're being the asshole. <laughs> well, not necessarily it's because... It's private property, though. So, you know, so, well, you know, so that's, some, that's some not... Some things we take is so th far out of context. That's not overlanding. If you're on there's, there's a lot more challenge to me. I mean, this is my opinion. Okay. There's a lot more challenges involved when you have obstacles that most things, except for maybe a tank and maybe even not even then, can get over. Sure. So you're building, you know, your, your journey is the build. Okay. You're building a functional, high performance machine built specifically for certain types of terrain and obstacles. Okay. You know, so that's the adventure, right? Sure. That's the enjoyment, sure. that's the fun. And then when you build something that works and it gets over those extreme obstacles and challenges, that's the rewarding part. You know, whereas like, I think overlanders, and again, opinion, I think, yep. you know, overlanders do the same thing, but in a different way. Like their adventure is, some of it's building the vehicle, yes, and especially building a self-sustained sort of off-grid type of vehicle, runs off of solar and whatever else, power all their stuff that you can use to get, not necessarily over obstacles, but get to that next destination to sure. find that next location or area destination that's just, you know, <laughs> super cool and, gotcha. you know, just extravagant when, you know, and that's the accomplishment there is just seeing new stuff and that's the rewarding that's the rewarding part for overlanding. So I think it can go both ways, but both have that sense of adventure, you through building and challenges and you know the okay. the obstacles and overlanders through, you know, traveling and different destinations and, and the scenery and so I think it's I think it's one of you know the same in a different way. Basically, okay. that's, that's so. And I, I, I respect that, and I, I'm just like, why is there so much hate between the two? Or is, is it not? Is, is it? Is I it don't not? Know if there's, there's hate. I mean, there's. Some, I think it's segmented. There's some <laughs> purists that maybe get more upset because people like Brent they see are more destructive to the environment, in a way, when they see what they need to do to overcome their obstacle. Overlanders are more about like not leaving their footprint behind. Um, I guess son of a my, <laughs> my advice to you guys, like anyone who really doesn't have a good idea what overlanding is, to check out Expedition Overlanding on YouTube. Those guys are amazing. Like if you want the like epitome of overlanding, their videos, their content is like mind blowing. And it, it kind of got, when I found them years ago, I was like, I really want to get into that. That looks like so much fun when you like build a rig, you know, they, their stuff's like so Is that nice. why you bought a trash room? See, yeah. see, Overland. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Oh, okay. Overland Expedition is, a, they've, they've got a great production team. They've got high dollar equipment. They've, they're on the like high end of adventures and and trips and traveling and but if you want I to think for for the most of us if we want to bring it back down to you know even keel ground level where most of us can do it at, not at that extreme you know channels like Northology Overland you know our friend Cindy she's got a really great Instagram and YouTube Facebook that you guys can check out that's that's you know more for the average person that wants to get out and travel maybe doesn't necessarily know how to start or even Fletch from All Things Overland. Uh, that's another really good YouTube channel where he breaks down getting into overlanding in you know the most um, 
trying to think of the word like the most like the easiest way to get into it without breaking the budget you know yeah okay so my my example maybe it was a poor example if you want to see how <laughs> how expensive the hobby can be yeah. if you if but if you, you want to see pockets if you want to see like very high-end quality content and like <clears> what <throat> it you know what it's all about it, yeah. it's somewhere to start i just you know i stumbled on them probably 10 plus years ago and i was like oh my god this is amazing yeah they really take a lot of time to do the storytelling gotcha too. yes i it's, just i guess i had to ask because We've never had this discussion before. I, I know you're more of like the versatile, like I'm gonna hop in a scout and hang with these guys, but yeah. I'm also gonna hop in my Highlander and I'm gonna go travel the road yeah. and not leave my footprint. And yeah. I guess I'm I'm not like either way. I'm just trying to understand, grasp it because well, I, love, I am I, love, I am more I of a hardcore traveling. rock rock crawler. I just I love oh. traveling and I love building things, so I can do both in both segments you know the rock sure. crawling segment the hardcore off-roading yep. and then also in the overlanding segment so overlanding is, is exploring yep i explore well <laughs> you explore jimmy's <laughs> badlands i explore there okay but it's like an exploration <laughs> trip in your oh, vehicle I you. I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm well no it's you a little bit kind yeah. of being a, a little bit I'm well, a dick, but. You know, and a lot of people probably ask the same thing. A lot of people have that opinion, like, I don't get why rock crawlers are the way they are. I don't get why these guys go beat the shit out of their machines <laughs> and break stuff, and it costs sometimes up to thousands of dollars to repair some of these rigs yep. just to do it all over again. Like, yeah. I get asked that all the time. The majority of people probably just don't understand that. So Until you go to experience it firsthand. Like, Brent took me wheeling this year, and I was like, that was my first time, like, in a real machine, like, real hill kill, and I was like, holy shit, <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah, but, it's an but adrenaline it's like, rush. It's <clears throat> a lot of people have to pick their hobbies because it's time, money, and space. You know, they only have room mm -hmm. for, you know, one passion. Sure. If I had uh, unlimited of all three, I would have all the different types of oh, rigs. Yeah. Yeah. For I sure. think maybe that's what it comes down to is, you know, you, you have your passion and it's like, oh, well, I love this. How can I take my Highlander and go overlanding when I see that rock pile and I'm like, I'm going to hit it. Oh, yeah. And you would, too. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> I guess Highlander maybe... would come back trashed the first <laughs> well, time you. I've <laughs> seen you go on wheeling and we had your Highlander on and every yeah. skid plate underneath there was busted yeah. off. But... Yeah, I still got to fix that. <laughs> but anyways, I think maybe. Uh, we should ask the viewers too what their opinion is. Like, what 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 do you guys think? What you know, rock crawling, overlanding. What what do you enjoy? Right. And, and what is your opinion of the difference? You know, yeah. we're I, I don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah, I would I would I would definitely love to hear what people's thoughts are on the difference, or you know, how do you guys look at overlanders? If you're a rock crawler, or if you're a hardcore, you know, extremist off road, and same with overlanders, like. How do, how do you see the rock crawling group? And is there really a, yeah, I mean, a, you know, a, a, I don't want to call it a racial divide, but is there really like a, a wedge between the two? A wedge between the two. It's, yeah. like, Are any, they, it's like anything, though. It's like, you know, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, you know, those guys don't like each other. It's like when you have brand loyal people, it's like, that's all I, I care about. When you get into your hobbies and your sports, that's all I care about. Not everybody is open to like all different motorsports. They're, they're just, you know, focused on one single thing, and in their mind, that's all there is. Well, and that brings up a good point, because we all know people can be very opinionated. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially you know? especially uh, behind the keyboard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, keyboard warriors. And, yep. oh, and that's yeah. fine. Yeah. You know, whatever. If that if that's well, what you're into, that's what you're into. To each but, their own, absolutely. But you don't need to push it on other people and be like, no. wow, that's stupid. No. You know, no. like that. As enthusiasts, I don't, I don't think... Like, I don't see that. I don't see a hatred. I don't see it. I really don't see, like, any negativity, per se. I, there but there, I see, there always like, will be, no I matter see, what it is. Yeah, there's just, like, a lot of misunderstanding sure. between the two. And and, and I've, never, I've never really been into overland. Like, you, I mean, you showed some interest in, obviously, with trail belt and stuff. I mean, the overlanding crowd is huge. And I've just never, I've just been the rock crawling guy. I'm like, hey, let's go out 
kill some hills and yeah. you know have a good time and well, see, I, I, I don't I, I'm not like opposed like oh they're weird I just I'm trying to understand like right. okay what's what's the difference like what what you know what, what my favorite hype? what my favorite part is about getting out and exploring and traveling and and doing the whole adventure thing and then staying in the car is it takes me away from the stresses of work of everyday life okay. And when you're out traveling that way, you know, overlanding, you're not so concerned about everything that's going on back home. You know what I mean? It's, you're not so concerned about everything that's going on back home and, and the stresses of work and finances and money. You're out enjoying your surroundings at a very slow speed and <laughs> It's uh, it's more relaxing, you know. I I, I That's get what that. I, see I guess about it. I enjoy my release at 6,800 RPM <laughs> rev limiter up a hill, but I, oh yeah, I respect that. I, I get it now. Well, and rock crawling and hill climbing and uh, ex more extreme off road. Uh, the more extreme off roading is an adrenaline rush, and that's exciting. You know, that's like parachuting or. Trying to think of other high adrenaline yeah, sports, sometimes but maybe you might need a parachute. Ask Blair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've I've rode with you. I know. You know, um, <laughs> I think one more point to make with overlanding, why it's so popular, is your overlanding vehicle can be your daily driver. Sure. Yeah. You don't need another vehicle, purpose-built vehicle, to do this. Correct. Just don't tell your wife that. Well, it just and makes it it makes it more <laughs> you know affordable, um, and practical. E e practical. Sure. Yep. I mean, Josh's overlanders is daily. Yeah. You know, you don't have to abuse it to get to where you want to go. Right. You can go you, out. You, you, you have to fun, drive. You can come back home and. You have to drive, drive smart. Yeah. And and know when like yeah my my rig isn't capable for this trail and right. I need to turn around. But you know, when you plan your your route, you will know you know right. if I have the appropriate vehicle to do this. But for the most part, your overlander can be your daily, making it a very affordable hobby to get into, where you don't need to have a purpose-built machine sure. yeah. that now you need to trailer and you need a truck to pull it and everything else. It, that, it and does it turns add into up. a very expensive hobby. Right. Yeah. Well, and you know the the, I mean, you nailed the. You hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, that it's practical because what we're seeing are the trends growing in that more, um, gosh, I wish I could think of the name. We're seeing trends grow in more of that, you know, like that soft roading segment, the, the daily drivers that you can still hit the trails on the weekend. Of course, you're not going to do the extreme hardcore stuff because it's still your daily driver, mm -hmm. but you're able to build something up and still use it to go out, to do your adventures, to travel, to do different things, and drive it to work every single day instead of having multiple vehicles. It's like tires. You know, you could have four or five different sets of tires for each different thing that you can do, but it just gets to be stupid expensive. And, you know, to have a couple or three or four different vehicles to do everything you want to do, like you said earlier, just gets stupid expensive as well. So I think a lot of people, they especially with what happened with COVID and a lot of people were at home and working remote and, you know, they wanted to just get out of the house and go explore and, and do different adventurous stuff and see different areas. And they could do it because you're in your own vehicle. You're not out in public. You're not drunk in public. Probably yeah, I just, have been. Probably just cut that out. There. I mean, so, <laughs> so what we're seeing now is, is, is uh, people – doing you know minimal modifications to their uh, crossovers getting just a little bit more ground clearance or a little bit more lift to get a, a slightly aggressive tire we lifted a rav4 last week it was pretty cool i'm not gonna lie it a actually subaru was ascent. a subaru ascent uh that rav4 looked like uh, it, it was a female owner that that did she's <clears throat> fairly young and she did it like spot on that it was the a color combination just the colors and just, it was just yeah. like it, it, it was very cool. tasteful yes. she had the uh was that the one with the black rhino the yes. overlands yep 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 so you she know, had black rhino overlands on there and bfg like ko2s one inch lift two, two, two inch two inch yeah, two inch. yeah. I mean, it was cool it was yeah. definitely i mean 
because I was following him to alignment. I'm like, I mean, we have overlanding would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, and that, that was like a prime example of taking your daily. That, mm -hmm. That's nothing special. It's all wheel drive. Yep. That's about all you really need to conquer uh, forest roads, most nice. logging roads, just to get <laughs> yeah. a little bit remote. If you want to do some slight like boondocking, slight remote camping, get away from everybody so you're not at the crowded campground. That's right. all you need. And yep. are you an overlander now? Are you a soft lander? Like, who cares? You're getting out, you're enjoying it, you're using your vehicle to get through the woods. Yep. And at the end of the day, you're driving it home, hit the car wash, you're going to work the next day in the same vehicle. And I would say that if you haven't experienced the hardcore off-roading, <laughs> that you should really try it before or you, go that saying? You should really try it before you. Before you buy it? Before, you, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't knock it till you try it. You don't, yeah, don't knock it till you try it, because because hardcore wheeling is is exciting. I think it is exciting. I, I think I understand, like, because we've never had this discussion before, and I'm like, okay, so you getting out, kind of just taking the road less traveled, mm -hmm. is kind of like me going up hitting a hill at. Yeah. You know, well, going with you is a thrill ride. It's adrenaline rush. It's. Nuts, it's like, am I gonna die? This, <laughs> gonna this is die? really cool. But uh, did you die? How did I survive? But then, you know, uh, <laughs> overlanding, it, it's totally different. Gotcha. It, it's, it's getting off the pavement. It's finding, you know, that old logging road or old, you know, service yeah. road that's gravel or dirt and, you know, using a little bit of technique to get through so you don't get stuck and trying to get to that really cool spot and you know hang out and yeah. camp and just relax and get away from all the bullshit. Yeah. yeah if you really want to just relax mild lift like a ready lift or something like that is uh expanding their line of lifts for that segment for the crv segment if you want to call it that so gotcha uh, so the, all of that is really cool and then of course method wheels black rhino Icon Alloys are three huge companies right there that do um, have a whole line. Each one of those companies have a whole line tailored to the Subarus, Toyotas. And those are really, I guess, the biggest two brands, vehicle brands that are. They're like the most popular all-wheel drive vehicles on the road that right. yeah, they make just a, um, a small, reasonable spacer kit just so you can get a slightly meatier tire under the vehicle. It's not really necessarily about ground clearance, but as much as wheel clearance to get a decent tire under your vehicle to get you through soft terrain. Yeah, and, and a lift will get you a little bit more ground clearance, plus the bigger tire will get you a little bit more ground clearance and traction. You know, and that's where the rugged terrains have really been, you know, shining in their uh, segment too. Is yeah. I would say with the, Overlander, soft road, traction would probably be the biggest issue. You don't want to be going down a, a, a wet logging road with your all season and you're stuck in the middle of the woods with no cell phone reception. I, and I, I would agree with that, but I would, also, I would also say probably just as important is ground clearance because you're talking about <laughs> a unibody type yeah. of vehicle. Well, that, that's also <laughs> knowing your vehicle. Especially like... And, and, and knowing when to stop. That's true, yeah. And, and, and your lines, you know, picking out your lines. You got to right. make sure that, like with the Highlander, there's, there's a, you know, it's a split drive shaft underneath there. So, you know, there's the um, carrier, the uh, drive shaft carrier bearing, right. um, you know, that I did bend. And <laughs> it, it, fortunately enough, we were able to, it wasn't bad. It was, we were able to just bend it back. Um, but having that ground clearance is my number one you know priority or the importance of lifting the highlander is to you know let's agree that if you're one to go push the limits on a vehicle that's not maybe necessary designed to go <laughs> off-road you should probably have a winch yeah. <coughs> if you're not going to go out with friends and even if a winch isn't in the immediate future at least a come along a high lift. You can use a high lift as a come along. A high yeah. lift or a come along. Yeah. 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 Cause I got, I do, I do carry a come along yeah. and recovery points. That, that's a very good point. A yeah. come along. Or the only time lift. I had to use it was to unbend the rack that was on the back that I used for carrying wood cause I hit a tree with it, but 
Yeah, so I had point. to use my come along to unbend the rack here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that would become your best friend very quick for yeah. 50 bucks if you're stuck in the middle of nowhere. Oh, a, yeah. com, a come along and, got, a good reco and a recovery you strap. You gotta have something. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be sitting out don't, in the middle of don't nowhere. Don't go out there without a, some sort of tool. Yeah. Even a heavy ratchet strap. But if you're an old man, when you have your rooftop tent, you can just sleep out there. Yeah. Well, if you don't have cell phone service, buddy, you're going to be out there a while. Yeah. Then you're going to have to eat your fingers. Oh. Yeah. And that, I mean, these are these are all really good topics that, you know, we could make Max tracks. several other videos with is, you know, what do you all equip with, yeah, you know, what I do you don't. all equip your hardcore off-roader, your rock, rock crawler with? We what should do you have, like, min minimal requirements would either be, like, you know, heavy, like, what, a five, like a five-ton ratchet strap, like, absolute minimum, and uh, the second thing would be, like, a come-along, and then, like, a high-lift jack. You need at least a 12-pack of beer. <laughs> That would definitely help, and like <laughs> definitely help. a 30-foot strap or a 20-foot yeah. strap. Yeah, yeah, recovery clevises, yep. snatch block, you know, yep. a winch, you know, minimal tools. Just yep. you should do like you know how to spend $200 to get started. Like it. we uh, we just had our video can our video planning campaign last week, I think it was, where we have a couple different videos on there that are tailored yep. to what to bring if you're going winter camping or winter wheeling. What to have as a minimum if you're just gonna go out and go exploring. So make sure and stay tuned for those videos because we're gonna cover those exact topics. So yeah, those will be coming out in January. It's all fun and dandy until you're stuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's all it, yeah until you're stuck or you're broke. And even yeah. good mapping systems too. I personally like Gaia. You know, I, I rely on Gaia quite a bit because you can be out in the woods and it'll track exactly where you're at. You can zoom in. You don't have to have cell phone reception especially if you've already downloaded the maps when you still i have like when you're somewhere where you have wi-fi you download the maps of where you're going to be so that way if you don't have any cell service at all you can still you know as long as your phone has power you can still find out where you're at exactly so we can get a little off topic talking about all the stuff we can bring with but you brought up a great point i think that was a awesome conversation about the difference in hardcore rock crawling wheeling and and even racing or desert racing or whatever it may be compared to, you know, just the, the even keel, even speed pace of overlanding and, and traveling. So Ford Excursion is the best overlander ever. Ford Excursion? I'm not going to – me and Josh can attest yeah. to that. We both had one or two That's of pretty them. much how I started. I love we, my we Excursion. We always set up yeah. the air mattress in the back of the Excursion. Yep. You can put a queen size air mattress <laughs> in the back. Like, how can you argue with we that? We have had a lot of excursions with the excursion. <laughs> God, are those yeah, just they like, are awesome. We did a we did a pull off once. I had the the V10, um, six point seven three. Six eight. You had six, the seven three. Seven three. And you a had six, the seven three eight. diesel. Six eight. Yeah. And then six, I had eight, yeah, yeah the six eight V10. Yeah. And we hooked a strap up, bumper to bumper. And did a pull off, and neither neither one of us went anywhere. We just smoked the tires the entire time. Like a V10 excursion <laughs> is probably like the best versatile vehicle yep. for the money because they're so cheap. Because <clears throat> yeah. everyone's afraid they're going they're going on gas, but they can do everything. Yeah. I yeah. Have, I have I love mine. Yeah, yeah I love too. my excursion. I had a seven three and a six zero, and mm -hmm. I I love them both. I yeah. no complaints except it's, they wander all over the road. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. It yeah. is what it is, but I mean, you can pull it whatever you want. You can haul it as much as you want, and if you want to use it as overlanding, Jesus, like having a palace. Yeah. <laughs> it's like going well, to a five-star hotel. Solid <laughs> axles, right? <laughs> Fit thirty sevens on them, probably barely with any trimming. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, and then you can use that and take that as your ultimate overlanding. Right? Takes our next episode. Yeah. Yeah. People are like, oh, they're too big. And it's like, well, you know, that's another good question. Not only. You know, what are your guys' thoughts on the differences between hardcore off-roading, rock crawling, and overlanding? But if you were to build the ultimate overlanding, hardcore wheeling rig, excursion, you know, excursion like what I, I, What would you guys build? Let us know. You know it, what if you of, want a, the do everything, it'd have to be an excursion, in my opinion. But yeah. I'm, well, I'm not going to disagree. It's yeah. hard to argue with, but people, are, some people, they really like that small rig that can just, they can put it anywhere and everywhere, right. but. That is, that is I don't, the I, big I don't disadvantage know. with the big excursion. Uh, ask Josh, we put the excursion in pretty curious predicament. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it's a yeah. it's not the longest wheelbase in the world, but like, 
Brent and I are, we're tall guys. Like we need our, our room. We're not gonna jam into a Tacoma. Yeah, I mean I could, but it's like, are you gonna sleep in the back of a Tacoma with a five and a half foot bed when you're six and a half feet I'd tall? I'd go for the tailgate. <laughs> Then yeah. the barrels in the middle on my toes. <laughs> and if it's got a moonroof in the Tacoma, you actually lose headroom because it has, I mean, unless you have the moonroof open and you stick your head out, but <laughs> 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 we had a few tall guys come in when I used to sell Toyotas that, you know, they had to have the non-moonroof version because it would bring the, the ceiling down. Just that like half inch like or another whatever. inch no, or so. No, it's like two inches. Yeah. Really? It's, it's quite a bit. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And what I don't like about the Tacoma, I, it's a great truck. Don't yell at me. <laughs> Every time me. I get in it, my knee hits the dash, and yeah. I always hit the rock. I feel, yeah, I feel like I'm gonna crack the dash because yeah, my knee is just like wham right into yeah, the dash. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I so that's cool. All three of us had experiences. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I loved mine. I, yeah, me too. I you only got, buy one again. I I would if I could find like a, a rust free one. I only sold mine because it was starting to get rusty, and I I was afraid of losing too much money before like the rust yeah. started getting too gnarly, but. That's when you cut it up and put rock sliders on it. I should have. So a couple of things for the next episode, which will be episode five, is to, well, let us know what you guys think about rock crawling and the hardcore off-roading and overlanding, and, and let us know which one you guys would rather do or, or what you do now. And or just, could, we, could we build a purpose vehicle for both? Yeah. yeah, and you know, what would you build? What would be the ultimate overlander rock crawler? We said it. It's an excursion. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, but <laughs> let them let, let them, them decide. Let them talk. <laughs> All right. Well, and does soft let roading offend you? <laughs> the soft <laughs> roading of wait, the well, soft roading or does the word soft roading? Well, the word soft roading. I'm a little weirded out. <laughs> Unless you have a Prius, then that that, that is a soft roader. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a whole other <laughs> demographic there. <laughs> I'm just kidding, buddy. Oh wait, what? All right. Well. We'll go ahead and wrap this up. That has been another episode, episode four of our Shop Talk series, and we definitely appreciate all of you guys for tuning in, for watching this. Don't forget to let us know in the comments below what you guys think about rock crawling, what you think about overlanding, and what would be the ultimate overland expedition rig that you would build. So with all of that said, guys, we definitely appreciate all of you for watching and all of your support. I'm Josh from Trailbuild, this is Blair, this is Brent, and we'll see you guys out in the trails. <laughs>